And when you go to talk to people who have just lost so much, what they want to do is they want to pick up the pieces and they want to repair. And they also want to do better. They want to build something better than what they had before. Uh, but the idea that they can't participate in these decisions because they're somehow too traumatized or too victimized is, is, is a myth. In fact, people show incredible resilience and strength in the face of disasters. I mean, I met a woman in Sri Lanka who had, was nine months pregnant when the tsunami hit. Uh, her name is Renuka. I write about her in the book. She had two kids and nine months pregnant, and she saw the wave coming. And she ran with you know, the superhuman strength and saved her two kids and saved herself. And then proceeded to try to rebuild her community. So people are capable of enormous amounts. Uh, how we respond to crisis really is a choice. And you know, the message that I have is not one that we are inevitably exploited. In the, in the face of a disaster. Uh, there are choices at all of these junctures, and I think we need to, we need to remember that. But this, this phenomenon that I'm calling disaster capitalism is really the opposite of that initial human response that we've all felt. We want to come together. We want to help. We want to repair. We want to rebuild. We want to check and see who's around and what's around and how we can turn this into something better. Um, what disaster capitalists see in a crisis is really the opposite of that. They see this phrase that comes up over and over again in the book, in this research, a blank slate, a clean sheet. They somehow confuse rubble um, with renewal. And there is this idea, and I saw, saw this in, in New Orleans just 10 days after the levees broke, meeting lobbyists and local politicians. In that famous quote uh, from Richard Baker, the Republican congressman, who said, we couldn't clean out New Orleans housing projects, but God did. That's what he saw. He saw an act of cleansing. You know, I, I am in a church, so I, you know, I, I would be remiss if I, if, if, if I didn't uh, go back to the source of so many <laughs> of these ideas of great cleansings and ruptures and raptures and floods. Uh, you know, this is a deep part of our Judeo-Christian mythology. Uh, this idea that, you know, I don't really like the world as it is, so like, bring it on, right? Like, let's have a huge flood and then I'll grab a few of my friends, we'll get on a boat, and um, <laughs> to hell with all of you. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think that that's actually Dick Cheney's climate change plan, so far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> this idea that there is, uh, there's some escape, right? If we don't like the world, we just need to, to, to shock it, burn it, uh, wipe it clean, and then we can start over. And Marsha talks about the importance of of knowing our history, and, and that knowing history is, is revolutionary. And you know, this book only scratches the surface of the history that we need to know to be resilient in the face of, of shock. I mean, this comes back to the myths that animate our culture, and the myths on which this country was founded. A bunch of people didn't like where they used to live. They were like, let's start over. Let's find a blank place. Terra nullius, right? No one's home. Except, of course, there are always people there. So they said, well, you know this uh, smallpox epidemic? This is maybe a God's blessing, God's work, you know? We couldn't clean out the natives, but God did. <laughs> We've been at this disaster capitalism thing for a long time. Um, and we are an amnesiac people. We are a people uh, in deep denial about our history our history of genocide uh, in this country, uh, in my country, I'm Canadian, sorry. We did it too. Um, the, and, and so we don't see the parallels. 
The way you become resistant to the tactics I'm going to be talking about tonight is when you can identify them when they're happening. And that's why it's so important to draw these connections. History is our shock resistance. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little, talk, talk a little history with you tonight. Um, and, uh, and tell you a little bit about, I, I guess I want to tell you, I'm not going to be able to lay out everything that's in a 600 page book, I'm not going to try, but I'll tell you a little bit about how this argument evolved for me and how I, how I came to the idea of, of the shock doctrine. Uh, the idea that our modern history, our contemporary history, has been shaped by this powerful idea that in order for the pro-corporate forces to get their way, they need some kind of a shock, some kind of a crisis that clears the ground, that readies the ground, uh, that puts us into a vulnerable state, at which point you can have what economists call economic shock therapy. That's what the book is arguing. Um, and I, I, the, the origins of, of this argument for me came out of the experience, Marsha mentioned that, uh, of the film that, that Avi and I made in Argentina. We went to Argentina after that country faced a very severe shock. Uh, as many of you remember, at the end of 2001, obviously most people in this country were focused, they had their attention focused elsewhere, but it was a major international news event. Argentina's economy crashed in an absolutely spectacular fashion. This was a country that had been the model student of the International Monetary Fund. They had followed the corporatist rule book. They had privatized absolutely everything. Uh, they had deregulated. They had embraced free trade. They had become a country that imported rather than manufactured. They had decimated their manufacturing sector. They had cut every function of the state that helped people, like education and health care and social services. Um, and the economy imploded. And the middle class lost access to their bank accounts. There was looting. Uh, people stormed the banks, pots and pans. You remember these images? So we went there, in part to get out of here. Um, and, uh, and we made this documentary asking the question, once this economic model has been rejected, what next? What alternatives will emerge collectively? Because in Argentina, people didn't respond to that crisis by abdicating power. In fact, they responded to that crisis in a very different way uh, than what the, the kinds of models that I talk about in the book. They responded to that economic crisis by completely losing faith in their political leadership. The chance in the streets of Buenos Aires in this period was que se vayan todos, everyone must go. Right? It was you people who did this. <laughs> yeah. I think they have a lot to teach us, actually. And, and right before, before the, the crisis really peaked, uh, you know, in, the, in, in the crash, the crash of the banks, um, there, there was already a great deal of disillusionment. And the government was trying to deal with the economic crisis by putting, cutting more and more, uh, imposing a new round of IMF prescribed austerity measures. And there were federal elections. And the candidate that, that got the most votes in those elections was a cartoon character <laughs> named Clemente. They, people stuffed their ballots with cartoons of Clemente. And Clemente is, is a, a very famous Argentinian um, comic strip. And, and Clemente doesn't have any hands. And the idea was that because Clemente didn't have any hands, he couldn't steal. So therefore, Clemente made a more credible politician than any of the ones on offer from any of the political parties. Um, 